I am Reverend Nick Filson. I'm so happy to be here with all of you so that we can re redo, re every time we come here, we act with compassion, reason, and respect, and we're empowered to promote a just society, and we return again together to create beloved community. And one way of doing that work is to remind us all that here in the CSRA, we reside in the lands of the Westo people, the Savannah Shawnees, and the Yuki peoples of the Muskogee Confederacy. Again, I'm Reverend Nick Filson. My pronouns are he, him. And today, I am very, very fortunate to be in a dialogue with worship host Cheryl Martin and faith formation enabler Desiree C. And a wonderful new book entitled The Rough Side of the Mountain uh, about the difficult path of ministry uh, for uh, in Unitarian Universalism for black women. So it'll be a rich and perhaps uncomfortable conversation for some of us, but uh, one that I think is important for us to have. And the three of us are, are co-creating this space alongside music director Joseph Patchen and the choir today. Um, the folks in our tech deck, of course, making us look and sound as good as possible. And, and all of you, we make this moment together. Uh, In-person and virtual visitors are more than welcome. If you are joining us by Zoom this morning, I'd like to invite folks to stay on the call for at least a few minutes after the service is over so you can have a little, little bit of fellowship time yourselves. Uh, if you're visiting here today in person, uh, I hope that you can uh, feel comfortable filling out a blue card in a seat pocket in front of you that you, you can give back to the greeters on the way out and that you can come join us for a little fellowship time in the common room after the service. And we'll come and say hi to you, uh, and we'll know you by the orange name tag that you're wearing, just to make sure you feel as welcome as possible, because you are welcome. Uh, and the information on that blue card will help us to stay in touch with you going forward after today. And whether you're here for the first time or the thousandth, in person or on Zoom, I sincerely hope you get what you need today. Here's what we have coming up as we create our, our shared lives together. Uh, just after the service today, the social justice team will be meeting uh, in my office. You can come to that meeting, whether you've been part of the team or not, uh, to, to hear about some important work we've started as a partner with a, a former uh, Richmond County public defender to hold our courts accountable and move, and move toward a more just uh, justice system. We'll also debrief about the march uh, to stop gun violence yesterday uh, that many of us intended. This coming Wednesday at 7 p.m., Ecstatic Dance returns. I hope you'll join us for what has proven to be an integral spiritual practice uh, time for a lot of folks. It's about an hour and a half with a small uh, introduction at the, at the beginning. I, if you come, I invite you to dress comfortably so you can, you can move. And then on Thursday, We'll have our playful Thursday soul circles. And since we're on a path of vulnerability in the month of March, I think you can expect the return of Jenga, a very vulnerable and risky game, as our meaning framing game of choice. Uh, see you at 6.30 for food, fellowship, formation, and fun. And yes, I do like alliteration. The pledge drive is coming up, officially starting next Sunday. You've probably already gotten your packet with important information about our mission and financial goals for this coming fiscal year. And if not, please let Ruth Garrison or Lynn Dennison know. We'll have a few special speakers from the congregation during the service next week, uh, sharing why they plan on raising this ple their pledge next year. And yet, I wonder if everyone here uh, can start thinking about why you personally uh, contribute to the mission of this church and why you too might increase your contribution to help us thrive. Very importantly, to better accommodate Sunday morning choir rehearsals and follow, uh, fellowship setup, and this is important, I hope, hope you're listening, beginning on March 12th, two we uh, a week from today, sorry, two weeks from today, Services will begin at 11.15 a.m. going forward, not 11. So again, I'll repeat that. Two weeks from today, services will start at 11.15 and not 11. That also happens to be when daylight savings time begins again, so you will only lose 45 minutes of sleep the previous night. You're welcome. <laughs> 
Choir rehearsals will then begin at 9.30 on Sunday mornings instead of 9.15. It's not much, but I hope this little bit of respite uh, will help folks feel more comfortable coming early on Sundays uh, to sing together. Speaking of music, uh, tickets are now available for our, our March Final Friday jazz program featuring the Ed Fuqua Quartet. That's going to be on March 31st. If you're interested, head to uuaugusta.org forward slash jazz to register and purchase tickets. And finally, start thinking about how you might contribute to the UUCA auction this year, which will take place on May 6th, including how you can help us prepare for it. Last year was wildly successful, and uh, we, we really want to recreate that and perhaps even do better. Uh, and if, but if for some reason you offered an item or service for the auction last year and haven't yet fulfilled that promise, I urge you to get that done to ensure faith in the event. Now, I invite us to enter this moment of worship, this moment of respite from the world where we don't escape the world, but lean into it in a way that fills our souls and moves us toward beloved community within, among, and beyond. This morning's chalice lighting is entitled Spirit of the Moment by Reverend Tony Vincent. Like all readings today, these words are published in the rough side of the mountain by Black Women Unitarian Universalist Clergy. Here in this holy place, on this day of fading winter and beckoning spring, let us give ourselves to the spirit of the moment and find the sacred oneness that binds all life together. Knowing that much is beyond our ability to change, life calls us to still act in compassion and fairness wherever the opportunity presents itself. Let us seize the strength of the ritual, remember, renew, and relive the taste of hard fought struggles in the human search for justice. We are hungry for the lessons of the past and for guidance towards the promise of the future. May we be open to all that expands our awareness and welcome all to enter our presence.
Good morning. I am <coughs> Margaret Tuck, representing the pastoral care team. Um, this is the time in our service where we share joys and sorrows that have come into our lives in the past week or so, and it is not recorded. <coughs> if you would like to share... I will say I sound worse than I feel, so please don't. I'm okay. But all of our friends who are young people or identify as young people, if you'd like to come up during this time, we're going to read a little bit about Sojourner Truth. <clears throat> come on, Vivi. You don't want to come up? Sorry, right, I'll get you next time. All right. Those are cute. Hey, bud. Come on. Come on up here with Zizi. Come on. She ain't gonna bite. Come on up. All right, so guys, today we're gonna talk about a little bit about intersectionality. So it's a big word, right? Um, but let me break it down in a way that I think is uh, easy to digest, okay? So when we talk about intersectionality, that's when you have two or more marginalized communities. And today we're going to be talking about the marginalized communities of black people and women. And you have two or more marginalized communities. And it's when you examine the intersectionality of what both of those marginalized communities go through when it's together, OK? So in this example, a black woman. Okay, and the complexities, okay, or the uniqueness of the prejudice of a person who has two or more of those intersections. So as I was looking for an example to discuss with you, Sojourner Truth came up, and uh, I think y'all are really going to enjoy this story, okay? It is a great read aloud, as in there is lots of um, vocal um, things that you know, alliteration and stuff, something like Reverend Nick really loves, okay? So she was big and she was black and she was beautiful. Her name was Sojourner. Truth be told, she was meant for great things, meant for speaking, meant for preaching, meant for teaching the truth about freedom. Big and black and beautiful. True, that was Sojourner. Sojourner was born enslaved. Her master named her Isabella, but Sojourner's mother, Mama Bet, and her father, James Bonfrey, took a first look at that child and decided to call her Belle. Seems her newborn's cry was ringing in good news. Nothing quiet about that girl. Well, Belle, she grew quickly. She was almost six feet tall while still a child. Along with her size, 12 feet, she had hands like hams. Lots of muscle on her bones, too. And no one dared pick a bone with Belle. She could plow, hoist, and haul better than any child her age. With her big soled shoes, she could stomp the beetles that tried to eat her master's corn. Belle's strength and size made her valuable. She was sold away from her parents when she was nine years old and to, and to two more masters after that. See, this was the ugly way of slavery. Belle hated being treated as property, and she hated shucking, boiling, hauling, and working all day for her master, John Dumont. John Dumont knew how strong and capable Belle was. He promised to free her if she worked extra hard for him. Belle wanted her freedom more than anything, so she stepped to it. She worked hard for many years. She polished Dumont's brass until it gleamed. She mucked his horse stalls. She churned the Dumont family butter twice as fast. Finally, 
Bell went to John Dumont, ready to be free. But John did not honor his promise. That's when Bell decided to run away. In search of freedom, Bell ran. She fled like tomorrow wasn't ever going to come. She covered some ground, child. She got gone. She refused to stop until she saw hope. Belle ran right up to Hope's front door. She came to a farm owned by a Quaker couple, Isaac and Maria Van Wagner. The Quakers were abolitionists. They believed in freedom for all people. Isaac and Maria offered Belle shelter. When Belle's master, John Dumont, caught up with her, Isaac offered to buy Belle's services. It wasn't Belle's work that he wanted. He wanted to free her. Belle's master took the money from Isaac, then he got gone. Right then, Isaac freed Belle. And even though Belle didn't have to run anymore, she set out on her own. Belle went to New York City, where she could be truly free. And oh, was that freedom ever sweet. Freedom made Belle want to take the heels of her size 12s and kick them up high. Belle celebrated her freedom by marching her feet straight to a job. Belle worked as a maid, a maid who made money for the work she did. No more master, no more cotton to bale, beetles to stomp, or corn to shuck. Belle soon learned that to celebrate freedom, she had to speak her beliefs. For her, freedom meant helping others. Freedom meant putting her foot down for what she knew was right. Freedom meant she would travel up and down the land to share her ideas. That's when Belle changed her name. She gave her slave name the boot and called herself Sojourner Truth. She said the, the name Sojourner was just right for someone who was a traveler. And truth, well, that was what Sojourner did best. She told it like it was. Now, Sojourner couldn't read or write, but she, should, she could sure speak her mind. And now she was free to go wherever she wanted to find folks who could help spread the word about freedom. She met many abolitionists, women and men, who spoke out against slavery. In her travels, Sojourner made a friend named Olive Gilbert. Olive was an abolitionist. She read the Bible to Sojourner. Sojourner memorized every word in that good book. She could recite the entire Bible from the Begats to the Beatitudes. Sojourner told Olive all about her childhood as a slave, and Olive wrote down Sojourner's story. In 1850, the narrative of Sojourner Truth, a northern slave, was published. And Sojourner carried her book with her everywhere. She st spoke out about the unfair treatment of black people and women. When Sojourner preached, she let her words fly free as the highest dove in the sky, or just free as the sky itself. Sojourner's voice was packed with power. As she traveled, she learned even more about the meaning of freedom. She found that freedom is not a place. Freedom is the fire that burns inside. And Sojourner Truth, well, she was full of fire. Once, when Sojourner was scheduled to speak at a rally, Someone threatened to burn down the building. But that didn't stop Sojourner. She said, I will speak upon its ashes. In 1851, Sojourner stepped stomp to a women's rights convention in a church in Akron, Ohio. There was no rain on the day of that convention, child, but oh, she was, oh, was there thunder. What struck that spot was strong and loud. It was Sojourner's step, stomp, stride. 
There weren't any big, black, beautiful preachers in that church, yet the main question was, should women have the same rights as men? And you can bet the men at that meeting had something to say about that. Most of the men were ministers. Like Sojourner, they knew all the words in the Bible. And same as Sojourner, these men were following their own strides. One minister said that men should have superior rights and privileges because men were smarter than women. And the next man to speak said, that men should be allowed to boss women around because Jesus had been a man and that God wanted men to rule the world. Then came two more speakers. The first one opened his Bible and said that women were lower than men because in the Garden of Eden, Eve had given in to the serpent and had eaten the apple of temptation. And the minister's friend said the women were too weak to deserve equal rights because they needed men to hold open doors for them, help them into carriages and over puddles. Well, that was enough for Sojourner. She stood up. She stepped from the back of the church to the front. She stormed past the stupidity of the men who had just spoken. And Sojourner put one big, black, beautiful foot in front of the other. And she stomped on the floorboards of ignorance that were underneath. To her, the arguments made by the men were the Beatles from her past. She couldn't wait to stomp, stomp, stomp all over them. Sojourner took each, uh, each man's belief and slammed it down like a nail. Her fist struck a hammer's blow to the podium. Bam! She said, you say women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches. Nobody ever helped me into carriages, and ain't I a woman? Bam! Down came Sojourner's hand, an iron fist smashing the lies of the day. Bam, bam. Look at me, Sojourner went on. I have plowed, and I have planted, and I have gathered into barns. No man could head me, and ain't I a woman? Now, Sojourna was ready to preach her beliefs about what the Bible meant to her. She spoke to the man who told of God's will. Now, where did your Christ come from? She asked, from God and a woman. Man ain't had nothing to do with him. <laughs> then Sojourna talked about Eve and the apple into the Garden of Eden. She said, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down, all alone, then women ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. Down came both fists. Bam, bam. When Sojourner was done, she told the congregation, now old Sojourner hasn't got nothing more to say. And that was the truth. Sojourner had spoken the honest to goodness. She was ready to step, and step she did. Her size 12s hit their stride, and off she walked, big, black, beautiful, true. That was Sojourner. The end. All right. So guys, y'all can go back and sit with your parents. And parents, if you have a kid that's under eight, seven, six, I'd suggest they go, uh, go play in the back during this time, because then some of the lesson might go over their head. The rest of y'all can come sit in here with us. Wow. That was such a wonderful story for all ages. Thank you, Desria. And now, as we enter into this time of meditation, relaxation, renewal rather, and reflection, I invite you to get comfortable in your chairs, get as comfortable as you wish, and just breathe, just be present. And I will 
And as soon as I find the right page, okay, okay, we saw. And we are focusing on our. To invite ourselves into this time of meditation, I will do this reading. It's called Jazz Vespers by the Reverend Jacqueline Brett. What I know for sure is that when life deigns to be embodied in the becoming and becoming and becoming in each one of us, it is only then that she is truly something to behold. The awesome beauty and magnificent terror, the fierce strength and tender fragility of life, embodied as a human being human, in all its glorious, terrible forms, each one of us bursting into being out of the DNA of of stars, now cells and sinews, and bones, and blood and flesh. Life, now speaking in the high-pitched wail of we newly arrived and baby born into human consciousness, and whatever life wants to offer us, into whatever we choose to offer it. And so the seasons begin. But what about the baby? The greatest story ever told about a newborn babe was, no, not that one, but this one. By a spiritual teacher in full awareness of her manifestation as divine feminine in the flesh, who said the greatest gift she had ever given, been given was by her mother Yes, her, real, live, earth mother, who was never deluded by the pudgy cuteness and smallness of her child, but always treated her as a being in full consciousness, awareness of herself. The only allowance her mother made was that her daughter was yet small and had not yet grown into the full status of her human body. And also, she could not yet speak in a language her mother understood. But she knew that would come because express herself, her daughter would. And her mother knew that if she as mother truly listened, time bending, stretching, listened for maybe hours and minutes. Her daughter would be understood, and if given space to conscious, consciously co-create her world, her daughter would, and so she did, and so she does. The extraordinariness of this story for me is that it is made of black girl magic, a little black girl made aware that she is. Over three quarters of a century ago, when an unconscious world told her, day after day, season after season, that she is not. I am awed by the great gift in this for any of us, and have often wondered what it might mean to treat a child, any child, in that first season of life as one whose great self lies not hidden and called, but is recognized and revealed to oneself, the great I am that I am, self, as spirit of life in the physical, fat body, thin body, small body, great body, black body, brown body, pink body, 
white body, he body, she body, they body, them body, we body, earth bodies. Fully aware that we have all come. Now what shall we consciously co-create together with all that is, with all that is, in all that awesomeness, note, that I did not say accomplish, but co-create. Out of conscious awareness of that which lies hidden and veiled, undiluted by the illusion of what we are not, or deeply don't even wanna be, no matter how good it looks on the inside, because this is no ego trip. When we deeply understand we are not those things in the hidden and veiled spaces of the greater essential self. And so what might we co-create in full embrace of this knowing that we are possibly from a sudden burst of light, that we are the light. So what might we co-create in this love, power and wisdom of I am spirit, that is life. And even still, with the knowing that we are in the physical, that we are in a time-space limitation with bodies that eventually stop working as we believe they should, and often far sooner than most of us would like, freak accidents, muted genes, chemical imbalances, cells and hormones that go rogue and betray us and there but for the grace of but we come to appreciate the aware the resilience of our forms because they can withstand an onslaught of the harshest toxins at least for a while and all the little parts that actually do work especially the parts we didn't know we had but come to understand we do need. And so we stand in gratitude and with appreciation. Because here's the thing, even in this, we are the possibility that is in each one of us bursting into being out of the DNA of stars, now cells and sinews and bones and blood and flesh life now living season upon season hopefully become aware and awake in human consciousness and whatever life wants to offer us into whatever we choose to offer it and such is the way of the seasons and ourselves behold with wonder and all. Hmm. And now let us enter into a moment of silence. Oh. Hmm.
Thank you, Joe. Blessed be. Um, now we enter into the time where we collect our offering to help us continue our mission of creative beloved community. If our ushers would come forward, please. So it is with sincere gratitude that I uh, am in dialogue today with Cheryl and Desria um, about a, a topic that is sensitive and uncomfortable and uh, you know, perhaps um, could bring up trauma for some, um, certainly more than others. And I just want to name as we enter this, this conversation that it is a real gift that they're offering today in relationship with us, to be able to share their stories, share their perspectives on a topic that directly impacts them every day. Um, so I, I have tremendous gratitude to both of you. I also want to name that we cannot expect them or anybody else to share uh, themselves as deeply as they're going to today in different contexts. This is a very specific context, and nobody is entitled to their stories outside of this unless they offer to share it um, as another gift, especially if that person or people um, are in a targeted identity group um, like we're talking about today. Uh, so we've already talked a little bit about this book, The Rough Side of the Mountain, uh, that was just released about a month ago, uh, that is the first book to really name specifically the, the trials and tribulations and celebrations of black women clergy in our tradition, Unitarian Universalism. Um, it's, like I said, it's the first time it's been written and that's not super surprising because there really has been kind of, kind of a, a vacuum uh, in, in this 
part of, of our story. Uh, and if you just look at raw numbers, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, it's, it's been a difficult uh, challenge uh, for all uh, women of color who have uh, um, become UU ministers. Just a few numbers here. The very first woman to be ordained, to be offered fellowship by the Minister of Fellowship Committee of the UUA, the Unitarian Universal Association, was Reverend Dr. Yvonne Sion, and that was in 1981, not that long ago. She wasn't offered full fellowship until 1989, which means she wasn't able to find a job for eight years. The second person uh, then to receive preliminary fellowship was in uh, 1982. She got a job a little quicker and, and uh, getting a job in 1986, still four years, um, which is a long time to, to complete your uh, seminary education and not get a job. And this is kind of the case for a lot of the folks uh, who have received fellowship and that numbers, those numbers are also starkly low. Uh, there have only been uh, 38 total black women to receive preliminary fellowship, and only 26 of those have received full fellowship. Um, and that's over the course of uh, the 42-ish years um, after the first person was given fellowship. So those are just some things to keep in mind as we talk about, uh, about the kind of difficult path uh, toward ministry, um, very much a calling of deep faith for, for folks. Um, what are some things that come up for you all uh, as we talk about this? <clears throat> I was just thinking about um, what we had discussed earlier, um, that I felt like that would be twofolds with the, um, with the, how long it took. Bec and the reason why I say that is because not only like taking on the position of a minister, that's a lot of emotional work but also taking on the position of a minister when you also tend to be um, tokenized, meaning like um, they come in and you have to do the work of dragging folks across the finish line when it comes to um, you know, race awareness, um, specifically when you come from a a historically liberal progressive congregation that tends to be this thing that I've noticed of we did it so we don't have to do anything else so meaning uh, a lot of work like real self you know reflective work uh, tends to not be done so I've hired the black minister I'm done you know, I don't, there's no more work to have to be done. So I think about like at the same time, um, like the, to come in, hopefully, um, and also kind of woefully is like, I'm wondering what congregation would be best fit um, as far as the foundational, like, you know, the ground has been laid so that this woman wouldn't have to come in and do all of that work because there's work that just you know naturally comes with it and then um, I would hate it if that woman had to do the emotional labor of well I'm the black woman that has to teach you all the black things as well um, so you know that was always what that was what my thought was when we discussed it earlier was like that there's another layer to it like you know, yes, I, I would have loved for her, when you told that story for her to be, you know, found her congregation within six weeks, six months, whatever that tends to be typical. At the same time, I was also like, well, I'm glad that it took a little time. And then what I seen it look, took a little time because I don't foresee knowing the 80s that there would have been that many churches out there who would have been ready to receive her and not her have to do twofold in that labor. That was just my thought. What about you, Cheryl? Um, one of the things that is just crossing my mind just now is that there is also a, a cultural component. Mm -hmm. um, 
especially in terms of the African cosmology and just the use of language, which is a bit of a sticking point because mm -hmm. um, a lot of, just speaking for myself, a lot of um, in the black community, words like prayer, mm -hmm. Jesus, um, hallelujah, amen, are, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, especially if, um, especially if you're part of a long line of Southern black church women, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 including my late mom, may she rest in peace. Um, this is a big deal, and sometimes that's a little difficult thing to come into with. I mean, this is, even in this, this congregation, there has been an issue to want to step away from words like hallelujah, praise, uh -huh. prayer, uh -huh. amen. And it's... Can I say, can I jump in? Oh, please do, thinking? yes. Because it's not religious, it's cultural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and that's the thing is like for so much you have to recognize because I know for me personally mm -hmm. coming into a liberal, liberal progressive uh, tradition, I was thinking and then once I had, you know, did did my work of coming from being re, uh, being a Christian and to being atheist agnostic was feeling like I had to cut that off. Like I couldn't say amen anymore. I couldn't say praise be anymore. And those, once I reclaimed those for mm -hmm. myself, I realized that it wasn't because it was religious, it was cultural. Like for me, it was maybe, for me, amen doesn't mean the same that it might mean, mean mm -hmm. for another culture. Like amen is a, I agree. Mm -hmm. That's all it means. Yes. I agree mm -hmm. with you. Like, I, you know, mm -hmm. what you just said, mm -hmm. I, I'm right there with you, yeah. you know? And so realizing I didn't have to cut that away from me, that yeah. I can yeah. still be in my culture, but also be true to myself as far as my religious mm -hmm. beliefs. Yes, and um, also, um, we st a lot of us still have uh -huh. relatives who still use that language. Uh -huh. Um, I'm thinking of one of my aunties in South Carolina. She's, she's still going strong at 90. <laughs> she's my late mother's sister, so. And uh, when we talk on the phone, she, she always mentions the Bible and just pray much, and that's just her thing. Uh -huh. That's just how she grew up. That's, that's who she is, and... Um, even though I may say it differently, uh -huh. or my spirituality may have taken a different path, it's, it's part of who I am. Uh -huh. What you're both naming is something that every single person who, re who offered a reflection for the book named, mm -hmm. is that they felt they couldn't bring themselves fully into whatever congregation they were a part of, because there was such a cultural divide between the dominant culture that had kind of... Uh, uh, very much created the, the tradition um, and where uh, where their heart was, even though they felt called to the theology of of, of the church there was still there was still a lot of cultural work to do there mm -hmm. that ended up making uh, many of these folks feel like they, they couldn 't actually do do the job um, which is tragic and i just I just want to name that even though uh, D dr Ivan Sian uh, ended up being uh, uh, fully fellowshipped and uh, finding a congregation by 1989, uh, the only way that she was able to do that was to create her own congregation. She never actually found a congregation to hire her. See? Um, and so, so th this I is... I didn't know that, but that makes sense to me. Like, when you say that logically to me as a black woman, that makes sense. I'm like, yeah. oh, of course she had to create her own. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a stigma there. Like, you have to yeah. create your own way, right? Yes. Like, which is, which which is, is kind of a... Kind of, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When I was like, 
that's that extra labor yeah. that I'm just that I was talking about. It's like I don't get to just walk in and the labor, the foundation, the groundwork has got to be done. I got to do the work of a minister plus I got to create the congregation. And never really feel like you can be your full yourself either, exactly. which is, which is a, a, a real tragedy that every person in your names as well. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a yes, further actually, thoughts that? Um, yes, just kind of just thought of something. It's just like um, in a lot of us, and um, I am telling on myself a little bit here. Um, just want to issue Sorry. that caveat. So, Come on um, with it. It's sometimes we feel like we have to be the, the safe black person, the non-threatening black person. And there's this sense of, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be seen as, um, are they seeing me as, as one of those mm. black people? Well, there's, there's the angry black woman. Yes, trope. exactly. Um, if you'll bear with me, I just remembered a story from years ago. We're not going to talk about how long ago that was, but, um, I remember in college, I had gone carpooled with um, two other students um, who belonged to this college organization with me. And um, just for the record, they were, uh, I was one of the few black people in this. And we were, I can't remember whether we were driving to or from Atlanta. Um, but, you know, we were in the car. Um, Molly was driving, and I think it was Molly and Steve. Um, Molly was driving us, and um, we were in Atlanta traffic, and um, on a good day, Atlanta traffic horrible. can bring out. Um, it'll, Atlanta traffic can make the Pope cursed like a drunken sailor <laughs> and that's putting it kindly so um apparently there was a a black man an african-american man in a in a, a van that cut us off and um the guy who was in the back seat with me yelled out you stupid n-word Keep in mind, I was, it's like, and I'm like, what, what? I'm like, what? The? I didn't say anything, but it's just like, in my brain was just like, what just happened here? And then he looks at me looking rather sheepishly. It's like, oh, as to think this was going to reassure me. It's just like, oh, you're not, oh. Oh, Cheryl, you're not one. You're not one of them. It's like, okay. And needless to say, none of us spoke a word on the way back to campus. And this is an experience that a lot of the folks who have gotten a job as you know, you minister have had. Um, you know, you, there's that really micro, bad microaggression of, oh, you're you're so articulate. Um, which is just don't don't say that to black folks. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Um, uh, it's because it it does create a pretty clear picture of what what you think most black folks are like. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is what a lot of these folks are experiencing when they when they enter into their ministries once they do get a ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for sharing that that story. And I'm I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah, that was just I just thought that just happened years ago, and it's just really came up recently it's just like yeah and incidentally on the since you talked about that um one of the things that honestly irritates i know it's well intentioned but i've gotten this from both black and white folks it's just like you sound like a white person mm -hmm because I do speak standard English, I don't use much slang, and it's just like. What does that, that mean? That is so, that yeah. is just really so annoying. It's just like. And also like, what does that mean? Like, you know, 
Like, what does it mean to speak like a white person? There is no white person English. You know, like, what does that mean? And that, yeah. You're doing a good job adhering to the dominant culture, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. is yeah, not, that's what it means. So uh, I, I got a name that none of the folks in this book want to be experienced as anything but an individual. They all name that, which is, makes sense. We all want to be seen as a whole mm -hmm. individual, a whole and holy person. They don't want to be made invisible, as it sounds like you kind of were in that back seat there, like, mm -hmm. um, or a token, as you mentioned earlier, Desria. And every single one of the people who reflected in this book also agreed that they are nonetheless impacted by their intersectional identity, by the combination of their womanhood and their, and their blackness. Um, and therefore, it, we can't ignore the problem. Uh, we have to talk about it. I just want to read a, 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 short, a short excerpt here um, to reiterate that. <clears throat> It is profoundly uncomfortable to feel like a stranger in one's own faith community when with one's chosen people. While race is a social construct and not real, Unitarian Universalism will not be successful in dismantling racism and white supremacy culture in our movement if we don't talk about race and the meanings attached to it. And uh, this is, uh, the person who wrote that is Re Reverend Dr. Kiyama A. Raman, who was the editor of the book. Um, so, you know, you probably have heard uh, the, the kind of newish idea that color blindness is not the answer because that is not the experience of black folks in this world. That, right, like uh, we, we have to acknowledge that it's a, a reality. And everyone's an individual. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex thing. What does that bring up, bring up for both of you? I was just thinking, like, when you first you said it, I was like, see me. Like, see who I am. Like, blackness is a part of who I am. And, and um, I know something we've talked a lot about is, you know, monolith, you know. And I don't ever want, this, this is me personally, the, the not wanting to see black people as a monolith, it means that instead you ignore culture. Okay, what I mean by that is like, yes, not all black people do da 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 da. The same way, not all white people do da 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 da. At the same time, there is black culture, okay, and there is things that we, you know, and it's always an exception to every rule, but that we engage in and that are um, are sacred to us and are meaningful uh, to us based on culture, okay? Um, the same way I would say like we were talking about, I was like, no one would say that I was wrong if I said that in Japanese culture, they tend to take their shoes off at the door. Yes, there could be one Japanese person in Japan who don't take the shoes off of the door, but we do know that in their culture that that does mean a lot to them, that that's what, it's the same for blackness, okay? It is the same for blackness. So what I would say is like, see me. It's not bad. That was the reason why I chose this book. Because like for some reason we have put big is bad, black, bad, like, no, she's a beautiful, big, black person. Love that, that's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that term. I don't feel bad when you say I'm black, I am. I celebrate that, I sit in that, I stand in that, okay? So what I mean by like color blindness is like, don't, don't take away that from me. Don't take that away from me. Like that's who I am. You know, what I do say on the other hand is don't put barriers in front of me because I'm black. That's what I ask of you. Like, I am black. See that. Love that part of me. It's not all of me. It's not all of me. I'm black. I'm a mom. I'm Southern. I'm all those things. See all of that. See that. And then don't put hindrances in, in front of me because of that. Did you have anything you wanted to say to that? Um, actually, yes. Um, 
I do agree with a lot of what you're saying. It's just, and it's also with the color blindness, it's just like, I know, again, it's one of these well-intentioned things. It's like, but um, I do have trouble with color blindness and can't we just move past color and stuff like that because that's not how this world works. <clears throat> it's a part of who we are and if I know even though it's well intended saying the color blindness thing uh -huh. means erasing part of who I am to make things more comfortable uh -huh. for somebody else. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's just, it's just. It's not helpful. It's, no, it's not. Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's just one of these things that's well-intentioned, but it's. Uh -huh. It's not helpful at all. No, it's it, not. It, from my understanding, it can cre increase trauma mm -hmm. when, when, yes. your, when your blackness is erased. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a sign of tremendous privilege for a white, folk, a white person to be, quote unquote, colorblind, because we're not actually impacted by it in the same way that, that uh, people of, with yes. more pigment in their skin are, you know? It's, mm -hmm. And so uh, we, have to, we have to acknowledge that, although yes, in the end, it may be, it, 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 again, Race is a construct. We want, we want yes. it to not be mm -hmm. part of our lives anymore. It is right now, and so we can't ignore that. Um, and you, you were mentioning earlier, uh, Desria, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the things you, uh, you don't want to hear from, from white folks when, when you enter into a mostly white space? One of the things, and we've discussed this before, is that if it's the first time you're meeting me, I'm speak for me, I don't need to know about you marching with Dr. King, and I'm tell you what I mean by that is. That is not, like, just talk to me like regular folks. Just, hey, how you doing? You know, nice to meet you, da 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 da, da. Now, in a space where it is appropriate to discuss, you know, whatever you, you know, encounter or whatever thing you've done, and is it appropriate? By all means, because that brings it you know, a fuller conversation. But to just walk up to a person, it's like, hey, da-da-da, I've done da-da-da-da-da. And it's like, I think it's well-meaning. At the same time, you're really, A, like, assuming that that's all I, like, have to deal with. Like, that's, and then, you know, like, that's always at the forefront of my mind. It's not, like, Racism is not always at the forefront of my mind. Like, it's something that can never be ignored, but I'd love to sometimes. I'd love to. Mm -hmm. And then, second, you're re-traumatizing me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, like, I was good. Like, I might have been in a good space thinking about da 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 And mm -hmm. then it's like, no. Now I have to pat you on the back, mm -hmm. you know? Now I have to think about that situation, that police brutality, or that, you know, that mm -hmm. whatever, whatever that's going on. And at that point, I wasn't in that mindset. And now I have to go be there with you. I have to go do that work with you. So Once again, putting the emotional labor on you. On me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any, anything you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, actually, um, if somebody wants to talk about their involvement in the civil rights movement, okay, that's cool. But just to like, just go into this thing like as if. It's like, okay, and? Um, it just seems like um, they're maybe taking a grant for granted. This is like, Mm -hmm. It is kind of that that pat on the the back and that gold star for yeah. just um, just being above that sort of thing. It's just like mm -hmm. it's exhausting. Or, yeah, it is. It's just like yeah, it's like and it's I can't think of. I just kind of lost lost the words for a moment. But it's just kind of like okay. I think it's it's cool and it's wonderful you did this that you work for integration, but um, that may be that may be something that we can talk about later or 
get into more later is just because at the moment maybe I am thinking about something like I gotta go I gotta pick pick up A, B, C, and D at the grocery store on my way home. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you mentioned earlier it's it's kind of like uh, um, when, once you hire that that black woman or black man even yeah. you think you made it we did the thing we find we, we we're woke y'all we did it um but uh I, that's really it, it's similarly uh when you've gone to a march or two um you feel like i did the thing we made it i i've i've, I've done my part um but that that isn't always the case and sometimes it can make it harder for us to move beyond the status quo and actually actually move into a space that's uh, more multicultural um, as, as we hope to. Um, uh, I do want to uh, read this little bit here from Reverend Dr. Adele Smith Pinneman, who was the second person offered fellowship, but the first one um, who was uh, given full fellowship. And she says, um, I then became the first to become settled and achieve final fellowship. I remember well my interview at a prominent multi-staffed church for my position as my first position as a UU minister. I was asked how it might be for me to work in a predominantly white congregation. I began my reply sharing that I had spent much time in white settings, that on occasion there might be tensions, but that I was planning to stress uh, saying in communication, even when differences arise and believing most people are of good faith, but the senior minister interrupted. Adele, I beg to differ, he said, drawing up to his full six foot plus height. I'm barely taller than five feet, she says. There will be no tensions. We are a very liberal congregation. I couldn't wait to flee. <laughs> Generally not the best to uh, uh, virtue signal uh, in that situation, especially when you're first meeting somebody. And I, I do want to name, though, that there is the possibility of white fragility in this, in this conversation, in this, in this process of growth, that it does, it does get uncomfortable. Um, I know that when, uh, when Desria and Cheryl and I were, were having a conversation in preparation for this, I, I experienced it for a moment, it, um, I, where I started to want to uh, shy away from getting into the tougher conversation um, because I didn't, of course I don't want to add harm, but I also don't want to seem like I haven't done the work. And, and I, do, I do work hard at this, but I'm also steeped in this culture just like the rest of us, and therefore I'm going to make, make some significant mistakes rather often, and I try my best to amend them. Mm -hmm. And so, again, this, this idea of putting the, moral, the, the, the labor on the folks who are most experiencing it, we want to avoid that by all of a sudden saying, oh my, oh my goodness, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to change, and, and, um, and then just all, all of a sudden trying to get basically pastoral care from the person you just harmed yourself. Um, so uh, it, I, it's a possibility. It is something that we are going to go through. Name it, try to own it, objectify it, and move on and be back, get back into relationship as, as well as you can. Um, so we've talked a lot about the, the difficulties of this, uh, of this uh, uh, the, the relationship between Unitarian Universalism and, and black women clergy. Um, so often it has harmed, and yet we still have some great f leaders, both as, um, as RE people, as lay leaders, um, and clergy who have stayed beyond, uh, beyond the shit they've experienced. Uh, sorry, kids. <laughs> I said most of them. Um, uh, yeah, bless my heart. Uh, uh, but the question becomes, why do black women continue to stay when it's, when it's not been a great experience? Um, I'm, I'm going to read a, a, a little excerpt from this, and I'd love to get your thoughts on, on, on that, okay? <clears throat> I knew the truth of how far we were from who we say we are, or at least said we want to be, and because I knew the truth, I knew the challenge of being in this faith. 
but I also knew that while this was a faith that was predominantly white, it was also a faith of great promise. It named its own problem, and it said it wanted to do something. I knew from my experiences in life that this was a start because you can't solve a problem you don't think you have. I also knew that it might be especially challenging for white liberal people because white liberal people are still acculturated to be white people first and too often think they are somehow immune to racist thoughts and actions. But the promise of the faith outweighed the challenges it presented. And I was willing to be part of a faith community that I knew would break my heart and that I also knew would fill my soul. And so people ask people, other people of color, why do you stay? Why stay in a faith that professes so much promise and disappoints so many times? And uh, she says, I have three answers. One, this is my faith home because I have no place else to go. Theologically, this is the only place for my soul. I came into this faith not for community, but for the theology, the openness to explore. Two, every community of people will disappoint you because people are imperfect. The shiny glow you found when you first arrived will lose its patina very quickly. This is true of our communities and any community. Three, you cannot change Unitarian Universalism if you are not a part of it. There is much to be hopeful about in this faith and its communities, but if you are not a part of them, you cannot change them. Just a short bit more. Then I give them some pieces of advice. Find your allies and your friends. Find the people, and they are here, who are willing to stay in the struggle with you. Then find some friends, people with whom you can openly be yourself. They're here too and keep doing your spiritual work. This is a faith community, not a social club and not a social justice club. If you came here for the faith, do the work of your own faith formation. The beauty and the challenge of Unitarian Universalism is that it will not give you the answers to your faith journey. It's yours to do. And keep patient. Sometimes you'll need some holy impatience, <laughs> but you must be patient. It is the only way to survive this faith. What are your thoughts, y'all? I was just thinking about when I first came. I, th I thought about this question since you gave it to me Friday. And I was thinking about the, f the why I stay, my personal reason. And it is very much the theology. For me, like she said, there is nowhere else to go. This is it. Um, yeah, I, be I agree with the theology. I believe in the theology. And then why do I stay here? This, this congregation, it's because I believe in the mission. So for me, it's, I believe in the theology, I believe in the mission. It's above, for me, what little things, well not little, microaggressions, that I have and I will endure. Because at the same time, like I was talking to you about, I can't get caught up in the muck of microaggressions. I have to do this, mm -hmm. me, I have to do this. Because for me, the theology and the mission is above that. I don't, um, feel, I don't feel any type of way for anybody who's like, nope, the muck is too much, I gotta go. I don't, I don't feel, you know, that's them. But for me, in this, in this space, in this moment, for me, I have to put the blinders on and I had to remember that my goal is the mission, and, and that's why I stay. You sure can. Yes, Please Four. say it. Yeah. <laughs> it's allowed. There you go. Cheryl, what do you, what, what do you have to say, um, if anything? Yes, one of the, one of the reasons I stay is also is for the theology, it's just like, this feels like the place where I am most free to um, just question and to have a faith that may, that may be different from the faith path that I was, I was taught coming up. And um, I am, and it's my decision to why I stay has been reinforced by the fact that 
we're having this conversation in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's not pleasant. It's, it, I know it feels awkward and um, I'm dealing with that myself. It's just like, and it's like, how do I talk about my situation without um, th automatically throwing out, making somebody feel like I'm accusing them of being a racist. I'm, I'm not making an accusation, I'm just stating a fact, but just like, I really appreciate the fact that these conversations are happening, that we are on some level at least willing to address the elephant in the room. And just acknowledging that we all, all of us, and including this person, we all have been affected by racism. It's just so much a part of the culture and so much of just our society that it's just unconscious. It's just, we've all been tainted and contaminated by it. And um, I just had to put that out there and it's just like, it's okay to be uncomfortable with that. It, it's going to be uncomfortable. And it's not, just working through that is not always going to be a nice and neat process. It's not going to be always sweetness and light. Sometimes it's going to be a hot mess. And if it is nice and neat, we're probably not doing it right. <laughs> uh, this, was, this was a long conversation. I appreciate everyone's um, uh, patience as we have this important dialogue uh, it, it, you know, it, I think there's some symbolism in that it, it, it was a prolonged uh, back and forth here that we, you know, it is a long term process that we're, we're diving into as, as a community. Um, and this is something that's been long term in terms of the, all the ancestors uh, of, of, of our uh, black leaders in this tradition and all uh, religious traditions uh, to get us where we are now, to get you all where you are now. Um, and uh, that's something that I think we can all rest on, knowing that work has been done, that we're doing work, and in the future, maybe, just maybe, we all uh, can create beloved community for everyone. Let's rise body or spirit for hymn number 1051. We are. We'll sing this straight through with no repeats.
You can stay up if you'd like. It's your call. <laughs> Today's closing words are from the epilogue of the rough side of the mountain. These words are written by Reverend Dr. Adele Smith Peniman. So we, Black Unitarian Universalist women, continue on our journey. Sometimes our steps follow the footprints of those who have gone before. And other times we are on a solitary pilgrimage marked by snares. But we hold to a vision of ministry that welcomes all people. In our diversity, exquisiteness, and quest for a more just society. So be it. Ashe. Ashe.